If you have a Bible, a note taker, if you have your mobile device, you can open up our app. We have a Living Water app, and you can see all the notes that are typed up here in your app, and you can follow along. If you do me a favor, if you have a social media account and you like sharing things, just share our YouTube channel right now. This message is very important. It's very timely, and it's for the body of Christ. It's not for people outside in the world doing whatever they're doing. Listen, this is not a statement that our church is making. This is the body of Christ being equipped to do the work that God has called us to do. And I want to equip you. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash go living water. And share that out and say, my pastor's got a word. Tune in. It's going to be powerful. I believe the Lord is going to speak to us over the next few moments. Have you enjoyed this series, Repurposed Prayers? Man, I've been encouraged. I've been watching Pastor Hayden last week, Pastor Maurice, Pastor Stacy, Pastor Tedra. Man, bringing powerful words that have been feeding our souls so that we could be ready to do everything that God has called us to do. So I want to say thank you to each of them. What a powerful series this has been. And we're going to dive in today and we're going to be in the book of 1 Kings chapter 18 and we're going to be reading about the prophet Elijah. And boy, what a timely word this is. God gave me a powerful confirmation just as I was studying for this. We wrote this series, all of the passages that we were going to study over three months ago. And just happened to be this. And I got an email this week that just confirmed to the T this is what we're supposed to do. So get ready. This is 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. And this is Elijah's prayer on the top of Mount Carmel. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, here's his prayer, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you are Lord that you are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. That's his prayer right there. That's that's what he really wants to see is God to turn the hearts back to him. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I've entitled today's message, Elijah's Prayer for Fire from Heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your table very hungry for your word, spiritually needing nourishment from you today. God, would you speak a now word into our hearts that would change us from the inside out so that we could be the people that you've called us to be, the light crying out in darkness. God, that people could turn their hearts back to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the people of Israel were in a really difficult place here. If you know that Israel, the nation of Israel, had been divided into two kings during the reign of Jeroboam, It was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Israel is the northern kingdom. And uh, 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 Jerusalem was the southern kingdom that was happening there, Judea. And God was doing a powerful work in the life of Israel through the prophet Elijah. Elijah had come onto the scene. And he came to a very dark time. There was everybody's heart had turned away from the Lord. There was a great famine that had come over the land with a drought for three and a half years. And it was a warning of God's judgment that was coming because of the wickedness that had come over the people during the reign of a wicked king named Ahab and his wife that he had taken from a very godless nation and her name is Jezebel. We find this in 1 Kings chapter 16. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Baal is a false god. And he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel. And Ahab made an Asherah. 
Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So now Elijah comes on the scene and he comes into a place that's extraordinarily wicked. The government had become wicked. All of the priests had turned away from the Lord and now they were serving false gods, the God called Baal. It was a very bad place. They had forgotten God, and they had began to worship idols. And so God sent a a three-and-a-half-year drought as a warning. Listen, when God brings calamity upon a people, it's a warning that judgment is coming. In fact, it says this in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 16, Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship then. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit. And you will perish quickly off the good land the Lord is giving you. This is what he warned when the law of Moses was given. This is the law of Moses. It said, if you don't obey my law, I'm going to shut up the heavens and there will be no rain and the lamb will produce no fruit. And so we find the story begin in Elijah's life in 1 Kings chapter 17. It says, now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be there neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And here's the warning that comes. There's going to be neither dew nor rain. What, what is he saying to him? He's saying you need to remember what Deuteronomy says. When there's no rain, it's a sign of God's impending judgment that's coming. This is a warning And we need voices to sound the alarm like Elijah did today. Today in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need voices like Elijah, in the spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist functioned in the spirit of Elijah. He came before Jesus and he said, hey, there's one coming who's greater than I, and he's he's coming to save people. Listen, we need voices like Elijah today. We need voices to rise up and speak against the evil. Not that's happening in America or in the world or in the, the, the culture around us in Hollywood. Listen, in the church is where it needs to be purified. It needs to happen in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There needs to be truth that is spoken. And unfortunately, we have too many preachers and teachers who are not standing for the truth in these days. They're not standing up boldly. They're just going where culture goes. Whatever culture says to do, this is what you ought to be a part of. And that's not what God's called us to. In fact, there's a warning given to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Listen, the church is fully aware of what's going on. Jesus says you're going to look at the skies and see the seasons, and you're going to know what's going on. It's going to be obvious to you. No one needs to explain or have anything written to you. You're fully aware of when the day of the Lord's going to come. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come on them as labor pains come on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness He's talking to the church. You are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You're not in darkness. And that's what the church needs to wake up to is that we don't need to live in darkness anymore because of the culture around us. We need to wake up to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and stand firm in our faith, not moved in any way. Where are the Elijahs today? Where are the Elijahs who are going to speak the word of the Lord in 2022? Where are those who are going to warn the true church? Be ready. Get your lamps full of oil. The Lord returns soon. He's coming. And if the church is going to be ready, we need prophetic voices like Elijah speaking up against the increasing lawlessness in our culture that's seeping into the church today. There's increasing lawlessness It's increasing and it's all around us, gossip and slander. Oh my goodness, rising to levels that I've never seen or even imagined before. 
Truth, truth is like a desert now. You can't find truth anywhere. It's either misinformation, disinformation. It's all over the place. We hear all these phrases everywhere that we go. We need truth to be spoken. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we find out Elijah. It says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Remember, he, he said in, in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, he said, there's going to be neither dew nor rain. Because that's what God said to me. And it says this, it says, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And in the third year, <laughs> wow, that's a whole lot of days, okay? Three years later, three years of no rain, no dew. Everything had perished. It was brown everywhere. I came back from a, my extended break and my grass was crispy. It was brown. Think of three years of no rain. Saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. That's what the word of the Lord came to him. I'm going to send rain. Go show yourself to Ahab. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. There was a severe famine that was already happening. And we drop down to verse 17. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have. That's what a prophet does. You have. I need you to hear the word of the Lord for you today. You. What God's speaking to you about standing in truth today. And your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. You have, command, you have, you have abandoned the Lord. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel. It's in the same range as Mount Fudge. That's the best joke I got for you today. <laughs> and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And Jezebel is the wife of the king. This is the queen. And, and they're now eating. They're a state-sponsored religion. No longer are they serving the one true God, Yahweh. Now the whole nation is serving a false God, and it's all the way to the very top of the governmental structure. From the top down, the whole nation has been corrupted. And now Elisha comes to speak boldly to the king and says, meet me at the top of the mountain and bring all your boys with you. Because I'm coming. And see, it was important to confront and eliminate these prophets of Baal before God sent rain, rain to the land of Israel because it was crucial that everyone understood that this was not Baal who was bringing the land, who was bringing the rain on the land. It was Yahweh who was doing it. It was the Lord God Almighty who was bringing the rain. And we need to make sure that we eliminate this false God, this idea, because Baal was a God of fertility. He was a God of a harvest is what they did. They were him because they believed in the fall. He was going to bring in the harvest to them. And Elijah needed to make sure on behalf of God that he represented him well. And he said, go ahead and bring them all up there with you to the top of the mountain. These prophets of Baal and Asherah were supported by the government. It wasn't enough for Queen Jezebel just to have a little temple set up. She needed to make sure that God, the one true God, was eradicated from all of the minds of every single person in the nation of Israel. This phrase, eat at Jezebel's table, is important because she was purposed that Baal worship was going to replace Yahweh, the Lord's worship in all of Israel. And so it says in verse eight, or chapter 18, verse 20, so Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel and Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Think about this. 
This prophet comes and he speaks to the people and he says, if Yahweh is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And their lukewarm condition, they couldn't even speak a word. A word to defend their own position of following Baal. A word to speak of conviction and repentance that they had been disobeyed to the Lord. They had no courage whatsoever. I find in the church today that there are people who lack the courage to take a side on God side, on the word of God's side, they just want to stay lukewarm in between two different positions, limping between one or the other. That word limping can mean bouncing or jumping like a bird jumping between two boughs, just jumping, just I want a little bit of this and I want a little bit of that. I want to feel good over here and I want to do this right over here. Just not making up our minds on what we're doing. Dancing between two opinions is another way that you could put it. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, says, how long, he asked them, how many more sermons do you want? How many more Sundays must roll away wasted? How many warnings, how many sicknesses, how many tolling of the bell to warn you that you must die? How many graves must be dug for your family before you will be impressed? How many plagues and pestilences must ravage this city before you will turn to God in truth? How long halt ye between two opinions? He was speaking in the city of London to over 10,000 people every Sunday in the 1800s. The same time Karl Marx was preaching his message of socialism, the prince of preachers was preaching the gospel. I say, how long are you going to tolerate all of this otherworldly mindsets in your life? It's time to turn to the one true God and follow him. But they said nothing. There was no objection. There was no repentance. They lacked the courage to either defend their opinion or change it. They just stayed where they were. And it says in verse 22, then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself. Or he is on a journey, or, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out upon them. And at midday past, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation or the sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered and no one paid attention. How sad it is to have a God of our own imagination, a God of our own doing, who absolutely does nothing for us when we're in a time of need. Oh, we serve so faithfully this God that we've created of our own imagination, but when the time comes where we need him to show up, he's silent. Listen, a God that you've made up, man, it's, it's wonderful to serve him because he demands nothing of you, but when the time comes when you need him, he's never there. We serve a God who's there when we need him, but he requires a lot from us to serve him faithfully without any compromise, without any part of our lives being given over to other things. In verse 30 it says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. and He repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. 
He took time to repair the altar. God had given specific instructions on altars that were built for him, weren't made from dressed stones, but they were made from stones that were just taken from the earth, raw in the way that they were, so that it could be seen that this is not the work of man. This is the hand of God. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four jars with water and Pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Now, remember, we're in the middle of a famine here. We're in the middle of a drought, and he's taking precious water, and he's pouring it on there. I think he's saying not only did God bring this judgment of a drought to the land here, and God's going to restore it, but he's, he's making it impossible. Have you ever poured water on something and tried to light it on fire? He's trying to show you the power that Yahweh has to fulfill his word. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it the second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. He was making it very clear that if God's going to do a miracle, it's going to be God alone. It's God doing it. He's got the confidence to believe that God has spoken to him and there's nothing that I can do that could thwart his hand. When his word has spoken, he is faithful to fulfill it. Verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. I just want to pause there for a moment. If you want a powerful prayer life, you need to learn how to pray the word of God. Elijah wasn't standing there in his own accord just making these things up as he went. He was praying according to the word of God. James says, you have not because you ask not and because you ask amiss. You ask outside of the will of God. You need to make sure that as you're praying, you're praying the scriptures. You're praying the will of God. As you're praying for your families, you're praying for this church, as you're praying for this nation, as you're praying for lost family members, remember that God's word has promises. Go to his word, pray his word, and experience the powerful prayer life that you have. Verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you O Lord, our God, and that you have turned their hearts back. He just wants people to know God. He's saying you've forgotten about your first love. You've fallen from where you should have been. Come back. Turn your hearts back to God. I need you to know him. That's my message to you today. I want you to know him. I want you to be convicted of a time where you've been in a drought, in a season where there's been no rain in your life, and you've realized nothing's growing. There's no spiritual fruit. Nothing's happening in my life. I need God to show up. I want you to know God. I want you to know his power. I want you to know him in your life. We have to understand this. And God answered with fire. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord is God. The Lord, he is God. Verse 40, and Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. Okay. Elijah's a bad dude, man. You don't mess with Elijah, dude. He will cut you. Cut you wide open, man. The fire of the Lord fell. Now, the law of Moses required that they put false prophets to death. That was, it was spoken in the law. And so if we're going to turn our hearts back to the Lord, we're going to follow God's law. And so we're going to put these false prophets to death. 
They were obeying God. They were doing everything that God had required. Notice that it said at the time of oblation or the time of sacrifice, there was an evening sacrifice that was required to be offered. And so Elisha wanted to wait until the time of evening sacrifice because he wanted to honor God and fulfill his law in its entirety. He wanted to make sure that he was following closely to what God had instructed. And so that's why they put these false prophets to death is because that they wanted to make sure that they followed the word that God had spoken. I want to talk about the fire of the Lord for a second. We're going to shift from this passage, and we're going to look at a passage in the New Testament that talks about the fire of the Lord. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12, starting verse 28. It says, therefore, let us be grateful. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is a beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 12. He's talking about Mount Sinai, and he's talking about Mount Zion. And he's saying, no longer do we serve God at Mount Sinai. We now serve God at Mount Zion, the new city, the place where God has established his glory and has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus and brought us into a place where we can serve God with gratitude, with reverence and awe, and that we can bring acceptable worship to him For our God is a consuming fire. Now, God fell with fire on the sacrifice because Elijah had called it down. But also, throughout the Bible, the fire, number one, represents the Holy Spirit. Fire represents the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit is working in the earth today? The Holy Spirit is God at work in the earth today. God the Father is seated on the throne and Jesus is seated at his right hand making intercession for us and the Holy Spirit is at work in the earth today. God the Holy Spirit is filling his people like never before. We saw our youth go to youth camp this week. They got full of the Holy Spirit, saw the fire of God touch this generation and he's burning up all that impurity in our lives so that we could be a pleasing aroma to him. He is representative of fire. Our God is a consuming fire. We see this in Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. Hallelujah. We're his wheat going into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable Fire, that's the judgment of the Lord that's coming. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's what John the Baptist was prophesying. He was saying that he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, and this is the first time it happened, and they began to speak in other tongues because they had the fire of God burning on their lives. We see this also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, and do not quench. That word quench means extinguish. Do not quench the Spirit The the spirit is a fire. He's burning, and we need to allow him to burn. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to have complete rule and control over our lives, over this church. He wants to do a fresh and a new work, a powerful work in our lives. The second thing that fire represents, our God's a consuming fire. Remember, fire represents judgment. It can also be phrased, fire represents purification. A judgment comes as a warning That there's impending judgment coming and God wants to purify us. I think that he's doing a purifying work in this place today. Holy Spirit, purify your church. It says this, again, remember Hebrews chapter 12. It says we serve him with reverence and awe. It could also be reverence and fear, reverence and trembling. That we serve God with this understanding that he is almighty God and he is going to judge the earth. And we have a reverence and fear. Yes, we love him. Yes, we serve him with gladness and with thanksgiving, with joy, but we serve with a reverential fear, understanding that God is powerful. I want to talk about this for just a moment because there is some ideas that have been creeping into the church. I'm not just talking about our church, I'm talking about the church. And these ideas have been creeping in and been sneaky and crafty and they've been deceptive and they've been coming into the church. And I want to warn you that the fire of God says he's going to judge First of all, the house of God. 
It says he's going to judge first of all the house of God. And I want you to understand how powerful this judgment that's coming really and truly is. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses says, Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image in the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. He doesn't tolerate us having these idols in our lives that we just kind of have on the side, a little, little side chick, a little, little side hustle, just a little side thing that I've got going on. I just want to go there when I want some relief, when I want some peace, when I want some happiness. I'm just going to go to this thing. And God's saying, I want to root it out. I want to get it out of the church. Fire represents judgment. Remember, King Ahab, King Ahab, chapter 16, verse 31 he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. The, the name Ethbal, it means Baal exists. It was like their doctrinal statement if you're a worshiper of Baal. It's Ethbal. Our king is Ethbal. And, and he, he shows us that Baal exists. It was their, it was their statement of faith. And the word Jezebel you notice that's in there, it's Jezebel. That's, that's an, the way that they translated it from the original language, it was an insult the way that they did it because they wanted to have an insult against this false god named Baal because of the way that they translated or transliterated the pronunciation of it. But the name Jezebel means where is the prince, the lord of the earth. And they would say this during summer in order to summon Baal so that he would bring the harvest in the fall. Because he was the God of fertility. He was the God who was going to bring everything. And it's interesting because this woman Jezebel is mentioned in the book of Revelation to the church. Not, not, not to the world. Listen, I got so many people that say, well, you got to preach about this, preach about that. Listen, the word of God is for the church. The word of God is for God's people. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to John as he was writing down the Revelation. And it says this about the church in Thyatira. It says, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire. Now, each of the churches got their own description of Jesus, and here they're describing Jesus with eyes of fire because our God's a consuming fire. What does fire represent here? It represents that purity that he wants to bring to the church. It says, and whose feet are like burnished bronze, and I know your works, your love, and your faith, and service, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. He's saying you're growing. Your latter works, the things that you're doing now, exceed what you were doing previously. This is a church that's vibrant, that's growing, that's spiritually healthy and strong and moving forward. I mean, it's powerful. And you're like, but he's got eyes of fire, right? He's going to purify something. And then, and then he says this. He says, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I want to sit here for just a moment. This is a word for us, the church. He says, you're growing in all of these things. You've got the faith and the patience and the endurance and the service, doing all these things. He says, but this I have against you. You, you tolerate you tolerate teaching and seducing of my servants. You tolerate it. What I'm saying is the church has not tolerated. We, we've been tolerating false doctrine, false teaching, things that go against God's truth. And we've been just letting it float around. We've been speaking it to one another. We've been sending it on our Facebooks and all these other things. We've been teaching amongst one another all of this stuff. And I'm saying we've got to get back. We've got to get back to what truth is. We've got to understand what God has called us to. We've tolerated false teachers. We can't tolerate any teaching in the church that allows us to be seduced to idols. He says that they tolerate that woman Jezebel who's teaching and seducing my servants. Jesus warned us of this. Matthew chapter 24, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. 
Don't let anyone lead you astray. Don't let anyone lead you astray. For many, get this, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one, I don't know if you've seen all the many. I forgot to highlight this many right here. There's many. Jesus is talking about the church here. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church. He's saying, look at this. He's saying, many will be led astray. Many will come in my name. He's saying, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And lawlessness will increase. And many will grow cold. But the one, the one, that's how Jesus works. He says to everybody, judgment's coming, to the many, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. But then he says, I'm going to speak to individual hearts one by one, one at a time, and convict you of your sin and allow you to come to repentance and follow Jesus. The truth, the truth. See, the name Jezebel had a powerful association. That's why it's mentioned in the book of Revelation. If you've ever heard somebody say, well, they're a Judas. Well, they're a backstabber, right? They're, They're a betrayer. Or or they're a Hitler. Man, they're a ruler that is just ruthless. They are just bad. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, that's a Jezebel over there? Right? It's it's got a negative connotation. In fact, throughout the Bible, Jezebel may be the most vile character throughout the whole scriptures. She's wicked through and through. Her her demise comes down to a very, very, very poor place. And, And you can read about that in 1 Kings. Jezebel was the one who seduced Ahab to idol worship to Israel. 1 Kings chapter 21. There was none who sold him slept to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the people of Israel. She seduced him to that. And listen, there are people who are giving no regard for God in this world today. There are people who are giving no regard for him. Uh, Over this break that we were on, we had a few ministry assignments. One of them, Bianca, did a wedding in Wisconsin Dells. And while we were there, we brought the kids, went to one of those uh, uh, hotels that had a pool and stuff. And so while Bianca was doing some wedding stuff, I was with the kids at the pool. And there was this baseball team that was there, you know, 10, 11, 12-year-old boys that were there. And, you know, they were just having fun, playing in the pool, jumping around, doing all kinds of stuff. Well, at one point... uh, there was only one mom that was there supervising them, and there was, like, a whole bunch of boys that was there. And, and they went and got the handicap chair for the little hot tub, and they had brought it down to the water, and they were playing on it and stuff like that. And I was a little frustrated because the mom wasn't stopping them from doing that because, you know, they're not handicapped, and that's needed for people who are handicapped. And so let's reserve that for the people who need it, you know. That's just a value I have. That's what I would teach my kids, you know. And so I was sitting there a little annoyed, but, hey, they're not my kids. I'm not going to mess with it and stuff. So they get done with that, and I go over to repair what they had done because they had left the chair in the water, and I had tried to move it and tried to use the little thing, and they had broken it. It was broken down in the water. And so um, at that point, I think the the mom who was there supervising had left, and it was just the boys, and I I called them over. I said, come on, boys, come on over here. You see what you did here? I said, you broke this, and now the people who need it can't use it. And, and you need to understand that, that you have your healthy legs. You have all of the things that you can do. There are people who can't, and this is for them. And you need to have reverence and respect for them. And there was one young man that, man, he, he got really convicted. He just had a tender heart. Man, he dr- really tried to help me repair the thing. We couldn't get it fixed, and I notified the front desk. And I, I told the mom when she came back, I said, hey, I just want to let you know. I gathered the boys and told them, hey, that's a handicapped thing, and that's for them and stuff, just to let them know, hey, I you know, kind of disciplined all the boys here, you know. But men need to stand up and do that, you know. When you see something that's wrong, men need to stand up and say, hey, there's something wrong here. But here's why I bring that is because our culture right now has no regard for the things of God. They're just breaking things that are supposed to be right, that are supposed to be straight, and they're making it crooked, and it's all going wrong. There are things in this culture right now, and we need people to stand up and speak truth and stand for truth and say, this is the right way. We need to walk in the ways that God has called us to because they're mocking God's design and order. Did you know that God has a design and order for things? In in Genesis chapter 1, God lays out his design and order. He says, let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Get this. And God blessed them. You want to know the first thing that God spoke over mankind? Here's the blessing. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God spoke a blessing over us and said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. I've actually seen people who are saying, I don't want to have children today because climate change is destroying the earth. And I don't want my children to be raised in a place where they can't breathe in 10 years. And I'm telling you. The word of God says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Anything that come against God's design is a satanic, satanic, anti-Christ statement. And you need to understand, God's design is for us to have children and fill the earth. I've been on airplanes, and I've looked out the window and seen huge swaths of land that are unoccupied. People who are saying that human beings are destroying the planet... Listen, those same people are getting on their jets and they're flying around the world, private jets. I'm telling you, there's a bunch of liars that are out there deceiving, deceiving you. And people use the same thing to bow down to idols. And and I'm just telling you from the scripture here, I'm going to back it up in just a second, okay. And I need to say a little disclaimer first and foremost. As a pastor, I realize that there may be some women in this room who have had an abortion. And I'm just telling you, this is a place of grace and forgiveness, and you don't need to feel condemned at all. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. You have been set free from your past. God has washed your repentant sins away as far as the east is from the west. I'm telling you, let the joy of the Lord replace that gloom and sadness. And remember one day that you're going to be reunited in heaven with these little children that never got to see this earth today. But now I need to make sure that you understand because this is a place of truth. This is not a political statement. Please do not hear any political statement in this at all. If you hear political statement in here, here's what I'm going to say to you, okay. I'm saying you have put a political identity on over a biblical identity. And you need to take that political identity off and be a child of God first. Your citizenship has been transferred from earth to heaven. You are a citizen of heaven. And you need to remember that. Not a political statement. This is biblical. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture scripture to you to back this up, but I need you to understand today in this house, I'm going to speak the truth from God's word. I'm not going to compromise or capitulate to the culture that's around us. We are going to stand for truth. I have seen pastors over the past three, four weeks stand up and say, we're going to stand up for women in this place. And I'm telling you, we're going to stand up for life. We're going to stand up for those who want to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with life, with godly people, the image of God that he created, life. Oh, we love people. We love all people. We love all people. And I'm telling you, just get ready because this is not a political statement. I know people who are on both sides of the aisle that are in this church that love life. They love children. They love women. Okay? We love everybody, but I'm telling you, there's deception that's going out, and you need to hear the word of the Lord. You need to hear the word of the Lord. Listen, the reason that Jezebel's spirit seduces a person to worship an idol rather than the living God is to rob God of worship and to feed spiritual energy to demons. You understand, idol worship, okay, idol worship. We talked about how Jezebel, she, oh, she, look at this, she, she got him to going after idols, okay? That's what a Jezebel spirit does. They cause you to go after idols. Idol worship feeds the kingdom of darkness. Your worship is powerful. And when you take that worship and you direct it towards idols, all of a sudden, now the kingdom of darkness begins to expand. That's why it says that there's strongholds that need to be pulled down because there are strongholds of deception that are keeping people held back from where God wants them to be. 
Ezekiel has a prophetic decree against worshiping idols, and he says this right here. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 37. For they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. With their idols they have committed adultery, and they have even offered up to them for food the children whom they have borne to me. Listen, whenever Israel went astray in the Old Testament, they would begin to fall into the pattern of worshiping idols by sacrificing their children to these idols. Time and time again it happened, and time and time again a prophet had to rise up. But notice it says for food. It's, it's almost like when, when we begin to do these worldly things and offer our children up to sacrifice, it's like we're feeding the kingdom of darkness. Why do you think that people are becoming so irate over this Roe versus Wade debate? Because it's a spiritual battle. It's not war on earth. It's a spiritual battle. And these spiritual entities are angry because the stronghold that they had are being pulled down. They're, they're frustrated about it. The Bible says that abortion is like idol worship. It's like worshiping idols. You're, you're offering your children up. This is ungodly. Scripture goes on to say this, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There's a present darkness that is around us. You need to have your eyes open and awaken to the fact that there is a spiritual battle and this battle is being waged in the minds of the people that are in this room. And I need young people to dial in with me. I need young adults, people who are going to college. You need to understand that there are ideas that are satanic, they are demonic, they are anti-Christ. And one of them is that abortion is women's health care. It is not. It is not. There are innocent lives at stake here. Scott Hagen, he's come and preached here before. He says the devil wants to control the jet stream, which is the heavenly realm. So he can control the mainstream, which is culture, in order to get into the bloodstream, the spiritual slavery of the individual of this generation. He, he wants to control the heavenly realm. Why do we pray on Monday nights? Why do we pray tomorrow night? Because we're warring in the heavenly realm for the jet stream over our community to say we're not going to allow it to happen here, not on my watch, not under our control. We are the church, and we have power. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. Jeremiah says, because the people have forsaken me and profaned this place by making offerings to other gods whom they neither whom neither they nor their fathers or the kings of Judah have known, and because they have filled this place with the blood of innocents, get this, the blood of innocents, and have built the high places to Baal to burn their sons in the fire as burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or decree, nor did it come to my mind. God says, I can't even fathom that my people would take the children that I put in them and offer them up as sacrifices to idols. You might be saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not, they're not doing it. I'm telling you, there's a spiritual battle going on around you. And if you don't wake up and open up your eyes, this is not a political statement. I don't, I'm not telling you to, I'm telling you what God's word says. It doesn't even make sense to him. And let, I want us to heed the, the warning of the prophets. And let's repent of all the deception. That's come into our lives through the culture and the world around us. There's tons of scriptures on this. I could go to town on this. Uh, uh, Psalm 139 says that God saw my unformed body in the womb. Jeremiah says that he called me while I was still in the womb. I heard the voice of the Lord. Elizabeth had John the Baptist in her womb. And when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came into the room, it says that the baby in her leapt for joy. I'm telling you, the scripture is very clear. It's not a clump of cells. It is a human being that has all the DNA programming that if you just left it alone and didn't touch it, it would come into the world. It would, you don't have to do anything to it. It's not your choice. It is God's sovereign will. You say, well, what about this and what about this? I'm saying, do you trust God? Do you trust God? I got all kinds of difficult things that come my way. And I don't say, well, 
No, I trust God that God knows why it's happening. We need to repent of all the worldliness and say, God, I fall on my face before you. Because fire represents judgment. And the last thing, and I'm going to wrap this up, I promise. Fire represents hope. Fire represents hope. It says this, let us be grateful for a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Fire represents hope. Why does fire represent hope? Because the fire of God, this consuming fire right here, it reminds us that on Jesus, on the cross, God placed all of the sin that I have ever committed and will ever commit on Jesus and burned the sacrifice. He let the fire fall on Jesus so that he could be the sacrifice, so that I could stand cleansed, healed, forgiven, given and walking in a newness of life that he has called me to. The good news, the reason we have hope is because there was one man, Elijah, who took on the entire wicked government and false religious leaders and he turned Israel back to God. The good news that we have today is that there are people who are walking in Elijah's spirit, in a John the Baptist spirit, who are making paths straight before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, purifying his bride from every wrinkle, spot, and blemish, and getting us ready for his. His kingdom, the truth that God is a consuming fire is comfort for us because the penalty for our sin was placed on Jesus at the cross and that we walk forgiven, whole, and free and cleansed because of what he's done for us. And so I want to take a moment, I want us to pray. If you'd bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place, maybe you're online today, God loves you and he wants you to turn your life over to him. Because he sent Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins so that we could be washed and made new inside. If you're here today, you ready to pray that prayer, just go ahead and get ready. On the count of three, I want you to slip your hand up and say, I want Jesus in my life. I want Jesus to be the sacrifice for my sins. I want the hope of heaven to be a part of my life. I want to repent of everything I've done wrong and follow Jesus in a new, in a new life that he provides me. On the count of three, are you ready? One, two, three. All across this room, I want to repent of my sins. I want Jesus. Yes, yes. I see hands up all over. Maybe you're online. You just put your hand up right where you're at, and we can put them right back down. Let's all repeat this prayer out loud to encourage those who may be praying this for the very first time. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you're coming to judge the earth, and I believe you take away sin. I believe you are a sacrifice for me. And I turn my life over to you. I ask you to forgive me, to wash me, and to give me a new life. Make me born again. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we thank you?